Okay. Welcome to tonight's Bible study, everybody. And uh, we hadn't had one in a couple of weeks, but uh, we got one tonight, and I hope you hope you enjoy it. Uh, this is the first night that also that we're going to videotape these Bible studies. Uh, I think Corey's got them, Chris. Uh, or excuse me, right here, Chris. Excuse me. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to be videotaping these Bible studies, and uh, if you know anybody that's got an interest in eschatology or last day events, uh, get the word out, uh, and uh, maybe they might want to look at some of these. Better yet, come to the Bible study. But hopefully this will, uh, will be a ministry that's, pre that's pleasing to God. Uh, Y'all pray for me to teach the truth and, uh, and to be pleasing to God, and I just want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sometime during, sometime in the Bible studies, I do a, I do a Israel update, and typically the Israel update is usually some things that happened a week or two weeks prior uh, to the current day, and some of you already know this, but, but you know Donald Trump, I think some of you know that Donald Trump introduced his the Donald Trump administration introduced his new peace plan, 181-page peace plan, I understand. Uh, he, Donald Trump, called it the deal of the century. And uh, he, in, he announced that last week, and it's pretty much dead on arrival with the Palestinians and the Arabs and uh, those people over in the Middle East that, tip, that are, of course, in, uh, Israel's enemies. And countries like Iraq, Syria, Turkey, uh, the, the Palestinians, Gaza, and such, uh, the the uh, are, don't like it at all. In fact, last Tuesday, the Palestinian president in Gaza, President Mahmoud Abbas, he made the statement. He says, uh, after this nonsense that we learned today, uh, we say a thousand no's to the deal of the century. So, uh, President Trump and uh, and the administration, it looks like, has got a lot of work cut out for them. So that's, uh, that's, that's part of the political news that they've got over there. I understand last week, too, for the first time in a year, that, uh, that, the, that the Palestinians in Gaza resumed their, their balloon bombs, their incendiary bombs. What they do is they take one balloon, two balloons, four balloons, five balloons, and they fill them up with helium, and they, they tie them together, and they'll take a piece of, piece of cloth, they'll soak it in, in kerosene or oil or whatever, set it on fire, and depending when the wind gets right, they release them, and they, have, uh, they do quite a bit of damage as far as starting fires over in Israel. So they started those back last week, and um, I understand that they resumed some mortar attacks last week. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I think some, they had some mortar shelling come out of uh, Gaza. And they also, last Friday, they, uh, they had kind of a riot, not a real, real big riot, but they had a riot uh, on the Temple Mount. So uh, everything is pretty much status quo over in Israel. Um, speaking of the Temple Mount, speaking of the, of the land of uh, Israel, uh, the, our title this today is, is uh, the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation. Uh, really, Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14, but we're only going to go over Revelation uh, set, set part of 7 tonight. Just for those who weren't here last Bible study meeting, we talked about two characters, the two witnesses uh, in, I believe, Revelation 11, verses 1 through 14, these two witnesses, last time we talked about them, they play an important role in the, uh, in the tribulation time. They p play an important role for three and a half years during the tribulation time. And we speculated, and you notice I use that word speculated, we speculated as to whom these two characters might be like all other Bible prophecy students do. Uh, some say these two witnesses will be Elijah and Enoch. Some say they'll be Elijah and Moses. The truth is, folks, nobody knows for sure because the Bible doesn't tell you so. All we, all we know is, uh, is, is uh, what the Bible tells us, and the Bible doesn't give us specific names as to the two witnesses. But I did say these two witnesses during their three and a half years, their 1,260 days, 
uh, on, on, on the earth over in Jerusalem who will be uh, at the Temple Mount in a lot of cases, they will zealously call the people during the tribulation period to repentance. They will foretell events, future events. They'll perform miracles. And they will announce that the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of God is at hand because it's not going to be very long after they come on the scene when Christ comes at the second coming and establishes his kingdom. And I did, we did say last week, we talked about it or last time, that after 1260 days of prophesying by these two witnesses that Antichrist will have them killed and uh, to, def to defile them, to desecrate them to, uh, to, to, as an act of uh, just nastiness, I guess you'd say. He'll leave their bodies in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half, three and a half days. But then something really neat comes up, and what really neat is coming up is they will be resurrected to, by God. They will hear those words, come up here. Old King James, I believe, used to say, come up hither. And they will, their two bodies will come to life. They will ascend to heaven on a cloud. And uh, that will be exciting. Amen? Amen to that. So with that background that we had last time, we talked about two witnesses. Well, there is more than two witnesses that's going to take place during the tribulation. There are going to be 144,000 more witnesses. Just read a book recently, and I like the way Bill Salas, uh, author Bill Salas, mentions it. He says, yeah, the 144,000 and two witnesses that will be, uh, that will be prophesying and, and doing an important ministry during the tribulation period. Tonight, I want to begin talking about Revelation chapter se 7, and I want to talk about two groups, two distinct groups of individuals that will play a very important role during the tribulation period. Now, as always, like we always do, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you, whatever it is, this is, uh, this particular Bible study is formal, in, I mean informal, excuse me, uh, and I uh, want to hear your feedback and your comments, so don't hesitate to chime in. So the one group is 144,000 Jews. We'll see more about that, why we call them Jews, why we believe they're Jews. Really, the Bible never calls them the 144,000 witnesses like it does the two witnesses. It says the 144,000. But I think it's pretty obvious when we, in the next, next uh, and especially the next lesson, that they are 144,000 Jews. The other group, okay, the other group in Revelation chapter 7 it calls a multitude, it's a multitude of people from nations all over the world. A multitude of, nation, of people from nations all over the world. And that number is not specified. We, a lot of Bible scholars uh, and Bible prophecy teachers and Bible students believe that these will be in the millions. In fact, a lot of Bible prophecy teachers uh, say and believe that there will be more people and I, you know, here again, you take this with a, with a grain of salt, but I've heard more than, more than one say this. There will be more people saved during the tribulation period uh, than in the history of the church. So that's a, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty daring statement. But uh, who knows? We look at our population now. <laughs> you know, who knows? So let, what I want to do is... Um, I'm, I'm not going to go over all these verses tonight. There's no way I can do it. But I do want to read these, and I want y'all to, to read them, uh, read them uh, at, a, at a later time, too. But we will, talk about, we will talk about a few of these verses tonight, verse by verse, hopefully, and try to explain it. So on your handout, where I put the, note, the, the heading 144,000 sealed, talking about the witnesses, in Revelation chapter 7, it starts off, and this is the NIV Bible that I'm, that I'm, <clears throat> that I'm using tonight. It starts off in verse 1, it says, After this, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the, on the land or, the, or on the sea or any tree. 
Okay. Joe, give me that next slide. There you go. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been giving, had been, had been given the power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Then he starts listing them. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. From the tri tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. 12, From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulon, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. So you got 12,000, and 12 times 12,000, somebody tell me, what does that come up to? 144,000. Aren't those Jewish names there? Now, you might have a lot of Bible t teachers, a Bible, quote, Bible scholars, that say, well, this right here is not meant to be, to mean what it says. They say this is to be taken symbolically or it's to be allegorized or it's, it's, to be, it's figurative language. And it doesn't mean that. It means the church. No, that's not what it says. We take the Bible for its plain sense meaning, right? Unless we see something such as, I mean, right, just in your face, symbolic language, apocalyptic language, uh, you know, then we deal with that when we get to it. So, that's the first, that's the first distinct group in our, in our Revelation chapter 7 tonight. But then this other distinct group starts in, in verse 9, in verse 9. This is the great multitude in white robes. Verse 9, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and, the, and, around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he, sit, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The, the sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, we're not going to have, a, that is an amen, Mary Beth. Um, we're not going to have time to go over them tonight. But these, I think most of you can, would, would agree, are the, are the believers during the, trip, people in, during the tribulation period, many of them who have, who have heard the 144,000 witnesses and there's angels that will be witnessing uh, during, the, during the tribulation period. These are people that have, many of them that, have been, that will be saved, all of them will be saved, born again. Uh, but unfortunately, Antichrist, especially the last three and a half years of the tribulation, uh, will, will hunt them down, will kill many of those. And these are the tribulation martyrs, you could say. Um, okay, but as we look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 3, three through 8, Going back to, going going back to the uh, 144,000 Jews, 
Let's begin with, with verse 1. Verse 1. Look back at your handout at ver, ver, verse 1, and I'll read it. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any word from any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Okay. Now we know that that's kind of a figurative speech there. Uh, you know, you know, uh, but it, 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 you know, we, we, at the same time, this is something that is happening, I believe, in the spiritual room. I believe there are angels. I believe they have the power to stop, to, to stop the, the wind, to stop nature. But notice it starts with those two, two words, after this, after this. To find out what after this means, and I know uh, Corey and a lot of other pastors, I know I've used it many, many times when we teach or preach in church or Bible studies or whatever, we always, when we get to the word therefore, okay, you have a therefore in there. What is, what's the main purpose of the word therefore? Somebody tell me. Go. You ask, what is it there for? Thank you, sir. Uh, you ask, what is it there for? Okay. All right. All right. You got to look, you know, you look preceding, okay. You, you look at the preceding verses, okay. This right here is similar. After this, okay. After this, okay. We need to remember, first of all, that the book of Revelation, many places, is a series of visions, okay, series of visions that John saw. And secondly, we need, in order to understand Re uh, Revelation chapter 7, we also need to look at the placement of Revelation chapter 7 in the entire narrative of the book of Revelation. And... As far as the placement of Revelation chapter 7, the author, okay, it, or let me say this, the, the, uh, it, it, the placement of Revelation chapter 7 appears as a parenthetical section between the sixth seal described in Revelation, Revelation 6, 12 through 17, and then the introduction of the seventh seal that begins in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. So you're reading through Revelation and you get to, you get, you start seeing the seals, you know, talking about the seals, okay, that are being opened in Revelation chapter 6. And the sixth seal is the last one that it talks about in the sixth chapter, okay? And then instead of, in, 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 instead of going to chapter 7, and all of a sudden they start talking about the seventh seal, he inserts this in there about the 144,000, okay? okay. Um, you know, for those of you who were, were here, when I talked about the, the seal judgments and the bowl judgments and uh, trumpet judgments and all, you know that seal number one that starts off in, in Revelation chapter 6, seal number one is, is associated with the Antichrist coming on the scene. Seal number two is associated with the Antichrist making war. Seal number three is associated with famine on the earth. And that's brought on because of war. Seal number four what is associated with the death with death as a result of war and famine. Seal number five is associated with the souls of the martyrs, and they are depicted under the altar of God and in his presence. Sounds like the ones we're talking about going to be talking about next week. Uh, those who became believers during the first several months of the tribulation, seal number six was associated with physical disturbances in the sky and, and the heavens as well as a great earthquake on the earth. And now before the seventh seal is announced, 
John inserts Revelation chapter 7 in the narrative. And this Revelation chapter 7 in the narrative gives us information, okay, about these two distinct groups, okay? So going back to those first two words in chapter 7, those, those words after this, some Bible translation says after these things, okay, One of the things that I, yeah, I think I, I did say this, excuse me. There are two places in chapter 7 where, where the verse begins with the two words after this. If I didn't say that, I'm saying it now. Uh, one is in Revelation 7, verse 1, and the other is Revelation verse 7, verse 9. So what a lot of Bible scholars say is that those are two distinct visions. Rather, there, rather than them being all one, both events happening in one vision, I don't know, but or they could be two distinct visions either. I don't really see where it has really that, any relevance to, to, to the outcome. But uh, the, the reason it's pl- the after this is put in there in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, I believe is that it... Uh, What it's talking about, the after this, are the six preceding judgments, or at least the sixth seal. Either the sixth sixth seal judgments, one through six, or at least seal number six, okay? Okay, so so from Revelation 7, 1, when we read it just a few minutes ago, we see in his vision that John saw how many angels? In Revelation chapter 4 angels okay these angels appear to have power over nature okay in this case power over the wind and this word picture that that you can see in the text here in this Revelation chapter 7 verses verses verse 1 2 and 3 the word picture especially in verse 1 shows the angel standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds of the earth. Now, another, th- another way I think we could understand that is to see the angels positioned on the, around the world on the east, one on the east, one on the west, one on the north, one on the south. And what he's trying to say there, I believe, is They have the whole earth, particularly nature, i.e. the wind. They have it restrained. And they have it restrained because something's got to happen. The 144,000 witnesses have to be sealed by by God. And then in verse 2 and 3, do you see another angel in there? I call that the fifth angel. Fifth angel coming on the scene. I'll read that right quick. If you look back at your handout, then I saw another angel. It doesn't say fifth angel, but it looks like fifth angel to me. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Verse 3, do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on on their foreheads of the servants of God. That's Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Now, notice in those verses, he said these two verses tell us that neither the land nor the sea nor the trees, they cannot be harmed until after the 144,000 servants have received the seal of God, until they've received the seal of God. Now, for those who are, uh, you who are curious as to the the timeline after the sealing of the 144,000, as I alluded to just a minute ago, all you got to do is just keep reading, keep reading. Because after after chapter 7, we have all of chapter 7 on your handbook, 17 on your handout, you have 17 verses, then comes chapter 8. Okay, after chapter 7 comes chapter 8, 
And chapter 8 introduces the trumpet judgments. And I want you to see the first two trumpet judgments. If you were to go ahead, if you were to read, I don't have it on the handout, but if you were to read chapter 8, verse, verse 7, you'd read about the first trumpet judgment. And guess what happens at the first trump, trump, trumpet judgment? A third of the land of the earth is going to be burned up. A third of the trees of the earth. Didn't that didn't that what the angel say just a minute ago in verse 1? Say that they couldn't harm them? That they couldn't harm the land? They couldn't harm the trees? They couldn't harm the sea? Until they have been sealed? Well, by the time you get to chapter 8, the 144,000 has been, have been sealed. They can never be harmed. My way of understanding is they will go through the tribulation intact, Okay. But it also says in, in, uh, in verse, in verse uh, 7 of chapter 8, not only is a third of the land, third of the land of the earth burned up, not only is a third of the trees burned up, but a third of the green grass will be burned up. Now, folks, I want you to stop and think about something. You know, we have a tendency to just read over these things. And nothing, not very many things uh, shock us these days but that to me is a shocking statement an absolute shocking that is one heck of a land mass to be burned up now we know it won't be all together it'll probably be on different parts around around the globe but that to give you an example that's like burning up all of north america all of south america and all, uh, not all, but part of Europe. That's how much of the land is going, is going to be uh, affected in a terrible, terrible way. And then as you continue reading in chapter 8, you read verses 8 and 9, which introduces the second trump, trumpet. And you learn when the second trumpet sounds that a third of the sea will be turned into blood, okay? Remember, just a few verses earlier, that four angels couldn't touch the land, they couldn't touch the trees, they couldn't touch the sea, but the fulfillment finally comes to where a third of each, in this case, a third of the sea will be turned into blood, a third of the sea creatures will, will die, have died, a third of the ships of the sea were destroyed, now stop and think about that. Think about that scenario. If my facts that, I, that, that if my facts is close, about seventy one percent of the Earth's surface is covered by the oceans. It's about 70, 71 percent. Imagine how many of you have been on a cruise before. Just about everybody. Okay. Imagine imagine the cruise that you went on. Imagine that all you saw was blood. Imagine the water had, had pretty much just turned to blood because of all the dead sea creatures. Just think of that. Think, think about the gut-wrenching smell. Well, that's, that's the kind of things that we people who take the Bible word by word in its plain sense meaning, that's the kind of things that we believe are actually going to happen during the tribulation period. Or it says a third of the ships will be destroyed. Uh, imagine that. I did some research on this today, and I understand that the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, they publish a report every year and keep up with the, the statistics and, and, and all the information on the number of ships, vessels, and stuff uh, that to get, a, get an idea about how much, how many goods are traveling over the oceans, you know, the cargo and such. And they had one that I looked up, and it, this one was uh, a little over a year old, the, the Review of Maritime Transport 2018 report. And this report says uh, that on, that report came out, and basically to summarize it, 
on any given day, there are 52, there's 50,732 active ships on the seas and the oceans, some of them in the ports, just a tiny fraction, in any one given day. Now, this figure, this includes only those large ships, those that are propelled, those merchant vessels of 100 gross tons and above. It does not include any kind of waterway vessels. It does not include fishing vessels. It does not include military vessel ships. It does not include military, oh, excuse me, it does not include uh, barges. Uh, it does... Uh, uh, any other type of ships, it does not include that as long as they're, as long as they're smaller than 100, 100 gross tons. So, so here again, imagine that many ships and the lives of all the people on those ships that are destroyed during this terrible time. Here again, my point being, why going over this last f five minutes, in Revelation 5 verses, Revelation 7, excuse me, the fifth angel in Revelation 7 verses 2 and 3 predicts that the land, the sea, and the trees will be destroyed. And sure enough, in Revelation 8, the fulfillment comes at the first and second trumpets. Okay? But again, this, this cannot happen Okay, this destruction cannot happen before the 144,000 are sealed. Now, Revelation chapter 7 that we read, verses 4 through 8, they, they give us a bit of information. They give us bits of information about the 144,000. And I don't think I put, did I put these questions? I don't know. Yeah, I put these questions on your handout. Some questions to think about. Number one, what are they or who are they? these 144,000. Number two, what is their significance? Number three, what will be their objective, 144,000? Number four, will they be protected? Number five, what impact will they have on the last period of the tribulation time? Now, most of these questions are probably going to be answered next, next week. We're going to have time to, to, to go over them tonight. But, um, but the verses two, three, and four in chapter 7, that right there is enough to see that they are called by God for some godly purpose. They will be called by God for some godly purpose. God even goes so far as to have their foreheads marked, according to verse 2. Now, is the 144,000 all the people at that time the Lord God? Is the the question is, is the, the 144,000 at that particular time all the people who love God? Those 144,000 will be, will be con converted Jews. Okay. And yes, they do love God. Uh, and they will be, and as we're going to talk about next week, can you imagine, you know, you, 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 know, how, you, you know how zealous and how persistent and how the Apostle Paul had a never give up attitude and didn't give up. Can you imagine 144,000 of them like that? So there's going to be some, it sounds like some tremendous evan evangelism going on dur during the tribulation. tribulation. Okay. Uh, but in, in verse 2, if you go back and look, look at, in, in, uh, then I saw another angel, verse 2, coming up from the east. Okay. Um, Having the seal of the living God. Having the seal of the living God. Now go down to verse 3. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of, of God. Uh, notice there when it says the living God. Notice there that it, when it says the ser ser servants of God, the, the grammar there, the way they put it, is the servants 
the, the, li, the servants of, of, the, of the living God. The living God. That's the definite article, the. That means these are unique, okay? The, uh, you know, you, you know, they don't have anybody else like them. God has nobody else like him. He's a living God. The 144,000, the servants in this particular case, in its context, there's nobody else like, like them. The, the Greek word for seal, S-E-A-L, the Greek word for seal that John used in Revelation 7 verse 2 is the word, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, you see it on your handout. Uh, it's either spragis or spragis, S-P-H-R-A-G-I-S. Strong's Concordance, G4973. And according to Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament words and the way it's used in the, in the context there, the Greek word spragis, and I quote Dr. Dr. Vines, is a seal or a signet, comma, an emblem of ownership and security, comma. Here, the person's to be sealed, being secured from destruction and marked for reward. That sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds good. Um, you know, you know, folks, for a thousand, over thousands of years, earthly kings have, have used wax to seal documents. I think most of you know that. An important document, usually back in those days in the form of a scroll, was usually rolled up, uh, especially if it had to be sent somewhere, uh, and then a hot wax was poured on the overlapping end of the document to secure that, to su the wax was hot, the wax would dry, and then it, when it dried, it would secure the end of the document to, to the body of the document. And the only way that the recipient or anybody else could open that document was to literally break or tear that seal, okay? But before releasing and sending the document, the king usually had a signet ring. Sometimes they didn't have rings. Sometimes they had like stamps and other things. But a lot of times he would use his signet ring and he would press it, okay? The, sig the, sig the signet ring had an engraving on it, okay? And he would, he would press that signet ring onto the wax, to make a mark. And the mark that was made in the wax was just as good as a king's signature. In fact, it was, it, was the, it was the king's or that person in authority, it was, it was his seal of authority that, that branded that document. Now, we need to remember that most people in history, back, especially even up until 100 years ago, you know, uh, most people, they couldn't read. You know, they couldn't, they, they couldn't read nor write, but they could see, couldn't they? They could sure see with their two eyes. And everybody knew, if you had a king, most everybody knew uh, and could recognize the king's mark that had been stamped on any document or on any kind of seal, whatever his, whatever his, uh, his his um, seal went by. Everybody knew it. And then I mentioned in verse 2, it uses the phrase, the, the seal of the living God. The seal of the living God. Uh, I like those three words. We should always think, you know, the living God. Our God's alive, amen? amen. Folks, uh, one Bible commentator claims the phrase, the living God is used 30 times in the Bible. Well, you know, I, I, like, to, you know, I like to check things out best I can. And I, I decided to see if he was right, so uh, I went on blueletterbible.org and I typed in, typed in the, the phrase, the living God. And sure enough, he gave me all those scriptures that had the living God. I counted them three times. Guess how many it was? 30 times. That was the King James Version. I did it with the New American Standard Version, and it was 27, 27 times. See how, how the versions 
you know, look, uh, they don't use identical words in each version. Um, but the thing I want to say here is you have study tools like blueletterbible.org. Utilize them. Use them. Back in the old days, I would have got, and I've done this many, many times, I would have got that big old concordance out, and I would have, I would have looked up living, and I would have been looking at our living or the, I don't want to go to the, I probably would have went to living, and I would have been looking for living God, and I would have had to go through, I don't know how many, and then I had to write them down, or I'd check them, I'd just take my, take my pen or pencil and check them each time, each time I found one. Tools like blueletterbible.org save me probably 15 minutes or 20 minutes, who knows. So utilize those. Utilize those. Amen, Corey? Amen. Yeah, that's exactly right. A lot longer than that, probably so. Uh, but you know, I like what Dr. John MacArthur writes in his commentary. Uh, his book, uh, John, Mac John MacArthur explains the book of Revelation, subtitled Because the Time is Near. And in regards to the, to the seal of the living God, Brother MacArthur writes, and I quote, In contrast to the seals of earthly rulers, the seals borne by the angel belong to the living God. The Bible frequently identifies God as the living God to distinguish him from the dead idols worshipped by unbelievers. The most prominent false deity of the tribulation period, Antichrist, will seal his followers, and the true and living God will seal his. End of quote. You know, old S Satan tries to duplicate Christ uh, like Christ, doesn't he? God's a trinity. Satan, Satan has his trinity. Satan, the antichrist, and, and, and false prophet. Okay. Um, Satan, he, uh, Satan has got his man to seal, to put forth a seal. So he can be a counter to God who's going to seal the, uh, who, well, we're all sealed ourselves as believers. But Satan just tries to, you know, he, he wants to be like God so much that he, the thing about it, when he, do, when he does things, it's, it's bad, it's wicked, it's evil. That's right, Janice. He's, Satan, is, Satan is smart, but in some cases he's not smart, is he? <laughs> He's a copycat. Yes, Mary Beth. Uh, we're talking about the mark of the beast? Yeah, they will. I'm just, that's a good segue. I'm getting ready to talk about that. Okay, uh, that's my next question. How, how many of you have heard of the mark of the beast? If you have, raise your hand. Mark of the beast, all right? The mark of the beast, and the beast in Revelation, there's two beasts. But the beast, in, in this case, the beast is the name given to Antichrist in the book of Revelation. So the mark of the beast will identify those who take this mark. It will identify those with the Antichrist, with the Antichrist. It will be, in their case, it will be placed either on the right hand, and I don't know if it's going to be I don't know exactly how they're going to do They got technology nowadays to where they could do it any way they want to. I mean, they got things that blow our mind. But it'll either be on the right hand or it'll be on, on the forehead. And those who are identified with Antichrist and have this mark will be able to buy and sell during the future reign of Antichrist, who will be the political and economic ruler over just about every, over almost that, the whole world at that time. So apparently, you know, just like we scan things today, just like we use our cards and iPhones, and just like some people have, you know, people have chips in them, and just like some people that work at businesses that have chips in them, and, you know, they don't have to pull the cards out if they want to go, go into the business or go into a room, they just put their hand up. So something along those lines, no, nobody knows for sure, but yes, yes, you have, they will try their darndest, Antichrist and his forces, to force people to take the mark, okay? And those who don't take it better get out of town somehow, get out, you know, get out some way, 
uh, because there's coming a period of time during that tribulation where they're going to go after them and try to kill them because it's obvious after a certain point that those who don't take the mark are believers in Christ, or Christians. Once you take the mark, the Bible says later on in Revelation that those who take the mark are basically paraphrasing or doomed to, to hell, to the lake of fire. Okay. Uh, now on your handout, look at Revelation 13 on the back. Revelation 13, 15 through 17. It says the second beast, and by the way, the second beast is the false prophet. That's, that's, the, that's the right-hand man of the Antichrist. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast. That's the image. That's, the, that's whatever, the, some kind of image is going to be set up in the temple during the tribulation time. And this thing, this image is supposed to be lifelike. It's supposed to be able to talk. It's, Lord knows whatever it's supposed to be. So the second beast, the false prophet, was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, who is Antichrist, so that the image could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. So those who will not even worship that image will be killed. Verse 16, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. So they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark. And what is the mark? The name of the beast or the number of its name. And theologians and Bible students and Bible prophecy teachers have been debating what, what exactly the name of that is. And I never have been convinced that, that it's Nero or so many of the others that I've heard o over the, you know, over the years. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but you notice it says so they cannot buy nor can they sell. Now I want you to think about this. Think about that scenario, folks. Think about. Imagine the suffering and the stress that ex is experienced by people who refuse to take the mark of the beast. I mean, those who choose to take to 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 not take. I mean, to uh, the suffering and exp stress experienced by those who do not take the mark of the beast. Those who choose not to take the mark of the beast, they won't be able to do like we do and others at that time that have the mark. They won't be able to pull into a McDonald's, get something to eat, or a Burger King, or go to or go to. Uh, crack a barrel like we did yesterday, Kathy. You know, they won't be able to go there because they can't buy. They can't, they, they don't have anything, they don't have that mark to buy. At the same time, uh, they won't be able to go into a Kroger or a Publix or grocery stores or, or buy. Now, I, I'm sure in reality they'll be underground and they'll be uh, hopefully the Christians will be sticking together. I'm sure they'll be sticking together and, and ingenious people, creative people that can somehow grow food or live off the land or whatever. Hopefully they'll take care of each other. But these particular people that, that don't take that mark, they won't be able to, they won't even, well, I'll see it, they won't even be able to run a business to, because they won't be able to sell goods and services because they don't have the mark. You know, it gives me a headache, folks, just when I start pondering such a scenario. So uh, these are just a couple of examples of those who refuse to take the mark of the beast. That's 180 degrees different from the mark that will be taken from the 144,000. Now, next week we'll start off with uh, what God's mark actually is, and you can read it, you can see it for yourself if you go home tonight, uh, but what God's mark actually, actually is that will be uh, applied to the foreheads of the 144,000. Do we have, uh, we have any questions or additional comments or anything? Read next week. Uh, uh, go over and look at your handout again, if you would, this, this week. And read Revelation chapter 7 again. Uh, think of some questions. Uh, read the first five verses of, chap of Revelation chapter 14 
and um, Lord willing, we'll meet back next time, okay? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' precious name, Lord. We thank you for this time together. Lord, we, we look at this, and we, uh, the average person would, would just be scared to death. And if I wasn't saved, I'd be scared to death. But Father, we as Christians, Lord, we are saved. We are born again. We believe, and we think that we have the scripture behind us that, that tells us that we as born-again Christians will not be on earth during this time, during this seven-year terrible time. Lord, Father, we just ask, Lord, that uh, while we have time on this earth, this might not happen for years and years and years, but then again, things could change overnight, and it could happen, it could happen overnight to where the world just, just goes, you know, just sets, gets into this type of situation. But either way, Lord, we just pray. You, you tell us to study your word, Lord, all of your word. You tell us to, uh, to become familiar with your word. You tell us to study, to, to, beco to, uh, to become approved by you, to not be ashamed. And Lord, uh, if there's any time in history where we need to, we need to hear, hear and, and study scriptures like this, it's now. Here again, we don't know when these things are going to happen. But Lord, if they do happen soon, we won't be surprised. And if they do happen soon, we'll be able to, if, before, if we are still here before the rapture takes place, we'll be able to tell others. So I pray blessings upon everybody who's here tonight. Help them to get home safe and sound. Help them to come back Wednesday night. Bless them. A lot of them have prayer requests tonight. Lord, you know who they are. And we just pray that you, your will would be done in every one of our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name.